Um, we can indeed, uh, you might have a consent thing to click, but otherwise we will let you get started. So Dr. Curry, thank you again so much for joining us and take it away. No problem, but it'll take me a, probably a few minutes here to share my screen and figure out exactly what I'm doing. Um, can't see myself, but we'll see. We'll see if it works. That's okay. Oh, we can see your screen. We see Zoom. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. well, that's, that's a good start. <laughs> I'll see if this works. Oh, I think that works perfect. <laughs> you bet. Okay, I don't know if you've all been to the Badlands of Alberta or not, but um, it's kind of like, you know, being along the North Saskatchewan River and looking at the rocks exposed, except there's a lot more of them. And this is a uh, dinosaur provincial park in Southern Alberta. And it's uh, arguably one of the very best dinosaur sites anywhere in the world. Mm. Um, we've collected dinosaurs there for a long time. And Lawrence Lamb uh, was one of the people who collected there first. He started in 1897. And uh, he was working in what's now dinosaur provincial park. And the specimens he collected went back to the museum in Ottawa. But uh, another person came in much later, and that was Barnum Brown. And uh, he was from the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And Brown uh, basically built a boat and floated down the Red Deer River. And this kind of flat bottomed boat, which is a lot like a, uh, a barge, um, doesn't draw much water. And so it didn't get stuck too often. And so he could load a lot of bones onto this boat and float downstream until he found a, a place where they could take the bones off the boat and then take them up to the prairie <clears throat> level and across to where there was a railway. Now we, uh, on the 100th year anniversary of Barnum Brown floating down the Red Deer River, we in fact rebuilt his boat and we did the same thing. And this was a wonderful experience because uh, uh, this boat actually weighed about six tons. Wow. And we realized that when you have something that weighs that much without even putting dinosaur bones on it, you don't have an awful lot of control when you're floating down the river. So we learned a lot about the early expeditions just by doing the same thing. And um, that was a fun expedition for us as well in 2010. And that was the 100th anniversary of Barnum Brown working in Alberta. And this is Brown when he was working in Dinosaur Provincial Park. And if you've go gone to Dinosaur Provincial Park recently, you probably recognize that this is the same road you take when you go down into the park and uh, look at the what we now have is a little museum there and uh, our campsites are there and so on. So that hasn't changed much over the years. The one thing that has changed, which is a good thing, is the road is now paved. And uh, back when this photograph was taken in 1915, they had to haul things up using uh, horses and wagons. And uh, they were shipping back to New York City up to four boxcar loads of dinosaurs at a time. And that's how rich this area was. So when you go to New York City today, like the Terrell Museum of Paleontology, you can see dinosaurs on display. But uh, these dinosaurs uh, in the late Cretaceous gallery are in fact mostly from Alberta. And uh, these dinosaurs are seen by more than 3 million people a year. And those 3 million people include uh, book writers and uh, people who are making films and so on. And it's one reason that Alberta dinosaurs have become so famous over the years. It's because so many people see the Alberta dinosaurs in New York City. Now, Dinosaur Provincial Park was actually declared a UNESCO or United Nations World Heritage Site in 1979. And uh, that was very exciting because um, it's the first time that an outside organization recognized how important Dinosaur Park was. And when you think about it, um, World Heritage Sites, they're not that common. It includes things like the pyramids in, in um, 
uh, Egypt or the Colosseum in Rome and so on. These are the most famous sites in the world. And Dinosaur Park was the very first paleontological site that went on the World Heritage List. So this was important because when you think about dinosaurs and you realize that there are a lot of dinosaurs in Alberta, uh, you think, well, maybe it's like that everywhere in the world. But when an outside organization like the United Nations or UNESCO comes in and tells you what you have is the best, then, then you think about it in a different way because you realize that it's not like this everywhere in the world, that it really is very special. And so Albertans for the first time, I think, realized um, just how important Dinosaur Provincial Park was. And they decided to build a museum, which was the Terrell Museum of Paleontology. And uh, it was built because of the UNESCO designation although it wasn't built in Dinosaur Park because Dinosaur Park was just too sensitive. There were too many dinosaur bones there. It would be very hard to protect them all. And they decided to build it in Drumheller instead, which is about two hours away. But that's okay. Dinosaur Park um, has really only been a park since 1955. Although, as I mentioned before, people had been collecting dinosaurs for more than 50 years before that. Now, how rich is Dinosaur Park? Well, we've collected probably more than a thousand skeletons of dinosaurs in Dinosaur Park. There are literally hundreds of bone beds. Bone beds are places where you get massive accumulations of thousands and thousands of bones. And you can just walk around and pick up the bones and identify the types of dinosaurs. And that tells you a lot about what the ecosystem was like when the dinosaurs were alive. So there are literally millions of dinosaur bones exposed in Dinosaur Provincial Park at any one time. So it is a very, very special place and it is incredibly rich. How many types of dinosaurs? Well, there's more than 50 species of dinosaurs. And that includes uh, things that you know probably like some of the uh, uh, duckbill dinosaurs like Parasaurolophus or some of the Tyrannosaurus like Gorgosaurus. And uh, in addition to that, though, we've also found more than 100 other species of animals. That includes things like turtles, birds, mammals, small dinosaurs, flying reptiles, uh, and so on. And uh, we also know of more than 500 different species of plants that were alive when those dinosaurs were alive. So Dinosaur Park is rich, not just in terms of dinosaurs, but in terms of the animals that live with the dinosaurs. And that's pretty special. This is uh, one of the skeletons that I found uh, in 1991. And there was just one single bone exposed from the ankle of this dinosaur. And uh, from that one bone, it turned out we had the whole skeleton on the tip of the nose, and I don't know if you can see this or not, but the tip of the nose is right here. Here's the skull. The skull is upside down. Here's the neck, the vertebrae, the hips, the hind legs. These are ribs, obviously, and here are the front limbs, one of them anyway, and the other one's on the other side, and of course the tail. And this specimen is complete from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. And that's how complete some of the dinosaurs are in Dinosaur Provincial Park. They're absolutely spectacular. And uh, we learned a lot from this one dinosaur, which is called Gorgosaurus. Here's another Gorgosaurus that we collected uh, just a few years ago. Um, well, 12 years ago, I guess it's a little more than a few years ago now. But um, this is one we collected for the University of Alberta. We have our own dinosaur program in the University of Alberta, which has been around since 1920. And um, uh, we collect dinosaurs like this. This is uh, just the skull, but we collected most of the skeleton. And it was on this area right here. Uh, the area looks very white and bright at this time because when we collected it, we had to use a helicopter. And uh, that meant that uh, we had to wait until the end of the field season, which was in this case, December. 
And uh, the day that the helicopter came to pick up the dinosaur, um, it had snowed. Uh, we weren't sure we were even going to get it out. That doesn't deter the helicopter in any way, however. So uh, it worked out very well for us. This is uh, um, Jurassic Forest near Gibbons, Alberta, just north of Edmonton. And if you haven't been to the Jurassic Forest, it's probably a good idea for, for you to go there. And this is a dinosaur that has the crazy name of Edmontosaurus. And uh, Edmontosaurus is indirectly named after the city of Edmonton because it's a dinosaur that we find in Edmonton and all the way down to Drumheller. In fact, this dinosaur is one of the most uh, best known dinosaurs in the world because its fossils have been found all the way from the southern United States all the way up to Alaska. And uh, so it's a very common dinosaur in a lot of ways, but it's a very big dinosaur too. It's bigger, as big as Tyrannosaurus rex and maybe even a little bit bigger. Um, but it's a fascinating dinosaur for us to uh, learn about. Now, um, let me see here. We're going to the next one, I hope. Okay. In Edmonton, we actually have bone beds where we find many specimens of Edmontosaurus. And this is a bone bed we have along White Mud Creek in the southern part of the city. And this is a place where a man in 1989 was walking his dog and uh, he found dinosaur bones right here. And it was part of a skeleton of Edmontosaurus but it turned out that it wasn't just a skeleton. It was more than 12 skeletons that are found over a great distance. And uh, you can see the people working here on the bones. Um, the bones, because they're in a bone bed, they're very dense. We have about 30 bones per square meter or per square yard, um, which is very, very rich. It's huge. The bone bed is more than 70 meters long in this direction. We don't know how far it is into the hillside yet. And we've been working on this bone bed since 2006. And then we did several years as well back in 1989 and 1991. This is how big some of the bones are. And uh, this is uh, a leg bone called a femur. This is one of the hip bones. Uh, this is another leg bone here, another hip bone right here. And uh, the wonderful thing about this bone bed is that the rock is actually very soft. Uh, this is what we call mudstone. And basically you just use a paint scraper and a brush to uncover the bones. And most of the big bone beds that we find in Edmonton are kind of like this. Um, they're pretty easy places to work as long as you don't have a big cliff. And unfortunately, a lot of uh, um, uh, the bone beds in Alberta are uh, near cliffs, but this particular one is not. And uh, this is looking uh, at areas that we've excavated over the years. Um, in this particular year, we were excavating this area and this area here. Uh, we do get rainstorms and snowstorms and things like that that um, disrupt our work, but we try and work anyway by covering up the area with tarpaulins and so on. Um, we don't just excavate the bones, we also prepare them and we do research on them. Um, this is a publication of the Canadian Journal of Earth Sciences where we published uh, 11 articles about the bone bed, that one bone bed. and. Um, in the future, we'll be publishing a lot more <clears throat> articles as well, uh, which also get into the popular literature because uh, other people write books about these dinosaurs and so on. So the Edmontosaurus bone bed in Edmonton has become very well known. Um, up near Grand Prairie, we have other bone beds. And this is a pretty cool one. This is a place called Pipestone Creek. It's just outside of Grand Prairie, about 30 kilometers away. And it's a bone bed we've been working even longer. Uh, this bone bed we originally opened up back in 1985. It's an incredibly rich bone bed, much richer than the Edmontosaurus bone bed in Edmonton. Uh, here we're finding up to 300 bones per cubic meter. 
So an area that's uh, one meter by one meter, but then one meter deep down as well, we can find up to 300 dinosaur bones and teeth and things like that in a, in a cubic meter. And this bone bed goes for probably half a kilometer. We know it goes deep into the hillside. And so not that long ago, um, we didn't know that much about growth in dinosaurs, but the Pipestone Creek bone bed was pretty cool because the type of dinosaur we get there is an animal called Pachyrhinosaurus. And some of you may know about Triceratops. Well, Pachyrhinosaurus is a little bit like Triceratops, except that it has, instead of a big nose on the horn, uh, on the nose, I mean, uh, that horn has been replaced by a massive boss or growth of bone across the nose. So in a way, it looks more like a rhinoceros than like one of these horned dinosaurs. But um, it still has horns. It has these, another boss of bone over each eye, and it has horns on its frill. Now, the neat thing is that when we look at a baby Pachyrhinosaurus, and this is a much smaller animal, only about a quarter size of this adult, the baby Pachyrhinosaurus actually does have a horn on his nose. And as he got older, the horn started to grow across the face and turn into a massive boss of bone. And the frill at the back of the uh, skull became much longer and bigger and had horns on it too. So we learned a lot about how dinosaurs changed as they grow. And of course we know as humans, um, baby humans have very big eyes and uh, large heads and uh, things like that. And it was exactly the same with these dinosaurs. And uh, it's pretty, pretty neat to think that um, a baby dinosaur might be cute, but actually some of these are really cute as well. Now, um, bone beds are places where we do find a lot of dinosaur bones in one single place, like the Edmontosaurus bone bed in Edmonton, like the Pachyrhinosaurus bone bed up in Grand Prairie. And uh, you think, well, maybe dinosaurs were really stupid because uh, they get themselves into situations where they die en masse. But mammals do it too. And so this is a photograph taken in 1985 in Quebec's uh, uh, northern part of Quebec. And what happened was this herd of caribou tried to cross a river in flood. And caribou are normally good swimmers. But when you put huge numbers of caribou into the river all at the same time, they start to panic. And when they panic, they start to push each other underwater and many of them drowned. In this particular case, these dead caribou, which go all the way up the river for more than 50 kilometers. Um, these dead I gotta caribou, go. Okay. <laughs> in this case, 10,000 caribou died in one night because of river flooding and their stupidity. But I gotta go, Philip. Okay, well, nice to have you. Thanks for coming. Bye, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Courtney. So the, um, the fact that 90,000 caribou survived and only 10,000 died means that it's part of a strategy that allows these animals to survive very well most of the time. But every now and then they get into these catastrophic situations. The same thing happened to dinosaurs 70 million years ago. And I think that's pretty cool that uh, we can just look at the modern world and see that there's always something that's some very similar to what happens to those dinosaurs. This is a very strange uh, named museum. It's named after me. It's up in Grand Prairie. And uh, that's very close to the Pachyrhinosaurus bone bed. And it's a pretty cool museum too. And it displays mostly dinosaurs from the Grand Prairie area and they're focusing on working on dinosaurs in the northern part of the province, which I think is really neat. Here is a, an adult dinosaur of a group, of, uh, another horned dinosaur. This is a different one, though, than Pachyrhinosaurus. This is called Chasmosaurus. And uh, we've got many specimens of Chasmosaurus that have been collected from Dinosaur Provincial Park. And Chasmosaurus has this huge frill 
on its uh, on the back of its skull, which covers up the neck and helps protect the neck. But the reason these dinosaurs had these big frills uh, is not really well understood. It's probably not so much for, for protection. It's a way that these dinosaurs were able to identify each other. So the frill in this dinosaur, Chasmosaurus, is very different than the frill in Pachyrhinosaurus, which is very different than the frill in Triceratops. But uh, most of the time when we find this dinosaur, it is adults. Uh, we don't find babies very often, but in 2010, I found this specimen in Dinosaur Provincial Park. And you can see that uh, in this case, um, here's the lower jaw, here's the side of the skull, the eye is right here. This part of the skull, unfortunately, was a little bit crunched, but this part of the skull is the frill, and that's the whole frill. It's very, very short. So we can see that baby Chasmosaurus was in fact like a baby Pachyrhinosaurus. It had a very short frill and not very big horns at all. And uh, this is what the specimen looked like after we prepared it from the other side. Uh, one of the neat things is that the whole side of the body here is covered with skin. And the skin is uh, preserved and uh, I'm just outlining one of the scales for you. Here's another scale, here's another scale, here's another scale. They're hard to see because the skin was very, very thin. But the scales on the side of the body of this Chasmosaurus look exactly like the scales on the body of um, an adult Chasmosaurus. We do find skin quite often in Dinosaur Park. Uh, but it's just that the scales were a lot smaller. So that was pretty cool. And this is a reconstruction of what that dinosaur looked like uh, that we included with the scientific paper when we published it um, in 2016. Here's another neat dinosaur and uh, somebody uh, has a, uh, sorry, a velociraptor on their t-shirt. Uh, but the very first of the raptors that was ever found was found in Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta. And it's an animal called Dromaeosaurus. And Dromaeosaurus uh, has a nice skull. Uh, the skull has fallen apart. So these are the lower jaws. This is the top of the skull. Um, here's part of the upper jaws and so on. So um, it's a dinosaur that was found in 1915. And for many, many years, we really didn't know what it looked like. Uh, we had the skull, but we didn't have much of the skeleton at all. Um, in uh, uh, 1985, I published this paper on Dromaeosaurus, uh, re-describing it. By then we knew it was closely related to another dinosaur from a different part of the world. This is Mongolia. And in Mongolia, back in uh, 1923, this specimen was found. And this is the very first specimen of Velociraptor, which you may know of from the movie Jurassic Park. But it's a very famous and very well-known dinosaur. Uh, like the Dromaeosaurus, though, we had a skull. And we had a few bones from the skeleton. So much of the skeleton we didn't understand at all until the 1970s. And this is an incredible specimen that was found in the 1970s in Mongolia. And this is a Velociraptor skeleton. Here's the skull, the neck, the body, the tail goes off this way. Here's its arms. And those arms are reaching around and clasping the skull of a plant-eating dinosaur called Protoceratops. And this is the skull of Protoceratops. You can see that the arm of the Velociraptor is actually inside the mouth of the Protoceratops. The other end of the Velociraptor is on the back of the skull of the Protoceratops. These dinosaurs, there's the other hand on the back of the skull. You can see this is a, a related to the horned dinosaur, very similar to the baby Chasmosaur we found in Alberta. These dinosaurs were fighting when they died and they were buried so fast in sand in a sandstorm that um, I think the Velociraptor probably killed the Protoceratops 
um, and its claws, you can see them here maybe from the side, were buried in the side of the Velociraptor, or sorry, the Protoceratops, but the Protoceratops before it died closed its jaws on the arm of the Velociraptor and the Velociraptor couldn't escape. And because they were caught in a sandstorm, the sand buried them fast enough that the Velociraptor died as well. And so this is an incredible site. That's what probably one of the best fossil sites in the world that shows interaction between two dinosaurs at the time that they died. So Velociraptor again is very closely related to uh, another dinosaur from Alberta. This is Sornithelestes. Uh, Sornithelestes is very similar to Velociraptor. This is actually a reconstructed skeleton based on a partial skeleton from Alberta and a partial skeleton from uh, Montana. Uh, but in 2014, when we were in Dinosaur Provincial Park, we found another skeleton. And it was found by uh, our main technician at the uh, University of Alberta. His name's Clive Coy. And uh, this skeleton is incredibly well preserved. It's the best skeleton ever found in North America of any of these dinosaurs. And uh, you can see here's the leg. Here's another leg, a foot. Here's an arm. The other arm is buried underneath. Here's the body. Here's the skull. The only thing we lost on the skeleton to erosion was the, the end of the tail. Uh, but we know what the end of the tail looks like. So this is a, a beautiful, beautiful specimen that's um, producing lots of research. And um, here's what the skull looks like a little bit closer. Now the skull's a little bit crushed, but I think you can see the teeth okay. And uh, this is actually the eyeball, where the eyeball would have been right here. And uh, um, here's the lower jaw, one of the lower jaws, and so on. Now, <clears throat> reconstruction of the skull may make a little more sense to you, but it's not a very big dinosaur. I mean, this is a dinosaur that's only about the size of a German shepherd dog. And uh, one of the fun things, though, that we found was that when we look closely at the teeth at the front of the jaw, uh, we'd never seen the teeth from the front of the jaw of one of these dinosaurs before, but it turned out that these teeth had been found for more than a hundred years in the United States, and they were called Zapsalis. And the teeth are very distinctive because you have serrations down the back of the tooth, you have small serrations down the front of the tooth, but the inside of that tooth is flat and it has these ridges on it. So they're very, very distinctive teeth. And it turned out that um, other animals like Velociraptor and Dromaeosaurus and Sornithelestes have these teeth. So the original name of this dinosaur from back in the 1870s was probably Zapsalis. So uh, it's something we're going to have to think about very seriously. Here's one of the claws on the foot. Um, the amazing thing is that in the case of this specimen, it includes not just the bone of the claw, here's the claw, the bony part of the claw, but it also includes the fingernail on the outside. And you can see that the fingernail extends the claw by maybe a third or a quarter of the distance of this animal and comes to a very, very sharp point. In fact, we can look at the x-rays of that claw and we can see that um, those uh, um, horny or keratinous or fingernail part of the claws are very well preserved, not just on this claw, but on the other claws as well. And that's kind of unusual. Uh, this is a big surprise to us. Uh, as the specimen was being prepared, we found a very large bone going into the body cavity of the Sornithelestes. So here's the shoulder girdle, here's the upper arm, the lower arm, and uh, this is the front of the body cavity where the throat and the, um, uh, not just the esophagus, but also the 
uh, windpipe and so on go into the chest of this animal. And this is a big bone stuck in the chest of the animal. And this is not an accident. Um, what's happened is that uh, we can take an x-ray again or a CAT scan and we can see that that, uh, that bone is in fact surrounded by bones on all sides that belong to the chest cavity of this dinosaur. This is a bone that this dinosaur choked on. So we know this dinosaur died because he got greedy and he tried to eat something that was too big. And uh, so he choked to death. And um, that's pretty amazing. We don't find that very often. Um, this kind of thing does happen today with modern animals too. Um, you may know about Komodo dragons. Komodo dragons are huge lizards that are found on the island of Komodo in Southeast Asia. And I was very lucky in uh, 2010 to go and see Komodo dragons and how they acted and interacted with each other. This is a pair, two Komodo dragons that were part of nine Komodo dragons that ate a wild boar. And uh, they ate the whole thing, completely dismembered it in less than 20 minutes. And at the end of it all, the only thing that was left was the head of the wild boar, which is bigger than the head of the Komodo dragon. And this big Komodo dragon picked up the head and he couldn't swallow it because it was too big. So he walked up to a tree and he kept pushing his head against the tree until the head of the wild boar went down his throat and he swallowed it. So this Komodo dragon, again, was a very greedy animal and he was running the risk of choking to death the same way that dinosaur did 70 million years ago in Alberta. Uh, we can take the bones of the, uh, the little raptor and we can section them. And when we do that, we can see that inside the bone is all the cellular structure that was there when the animal was alive. And you can also see these rings. These are like tree rings. And they tell us how old that dinosaur was when it died. And so we know that that uh, Sornithelestes, that raptor, was in fact about 12 years old when it died. And it had stopped growing. It was uh, full adult size. Uh, we saw something else unusual. In the rib cage, we could see this uh, long line of yellow snaking through the inside of the rib cage. And we cut a piece out of it. And we put that in a machine where we analyzed it for the chemistry inside that uh, plug of bone that we took from inside the uh, dinosaurs, uh, chest cavity, body cavity, and uh, there was no question that uh, there were certain chemo chemicals that were there in great abundance, and they showed us these were in fact chemicals that we would expect to find in bone, that in fact we were looking at the intestines of that dinosaur, and the intestines of that dinosaur included um, bone that had been swallowed, and had been dissolved inside the body cavity of that dinosaur and uh, was coming out the other end. So that's pretty neat as well. That's just another thing we can learn about dinosaurs these days by using technology. And uh, here's one of the biggest surprises though. This is um, some structures that we find inside the bone. And we believe that these structures may in fact be blood vessels found in the bone of the dinosaur. And uh, inside those blood vessels, sometimes we even see these things which are red blood cells. So for a long time, we thought it was impossible for these things to preserve, but it was impossible to change that idea because we were convinced that they couldn't be preserved, therefore we wouldn't look for them. And uh, uh, back in 2005, somebody by accident did find blood vessels in a Tyrannosaurus rex specimen and uh, changed the way we think about these things. Now that we look for 
uh, blood vessels inside of bone. We in fact find them quite frequently, especially in Dinosaur Provincial Park. So sometimes um, even the biggest dinosaurs, uh, we learn a lot about uh, their biology by looking under a microscope and finding things like blood vessels and red blood cells. And it tells us a lot about their relationships. I just wanted to finish with a, uh, uh, this is a lower jaw. And uh, this is a CAT scan that was uh, put together essentially by a synchrotron in Saskatoon. It's one of the most sophisticated pieces of equipment in the world today. And this is a very small bone, only about the size of your thumb. And it's a baby Tyrannosaur. So something related to Tyrannosaurus rex or Gorgosaurus. And uh, this is the lower jaw. And you can see it from the outside here. This is uh, um, some of the teeth are still in the sockets. And uh, we believe that this uh, baby Tyrannosaur was probably less than a year old when it died. And it looks very different than the adult Tyrannosaur, the same way that the baby Chasmosaur, the baby Pachyrhinosaurus look different than the adult versions of that. And um, so we can use very sophisticated equipment to sometimes understand what um, uh, the biology of the dinosaurs was like. And uh, I think that's pretty amazing. I first uh, got this specimen actually about 30 years ago. And uh, at that time, we didn't have the technology to really do the work on it. This is what the specimen looked like. Um, but using uh, CAT scans, x-rays, uh, synchrotrons and so on, we could reassemble exactly what that looks like. And that's pretty cool. Well, my purpose in life is to uh, find as many dinosaurs as I can, of course, because I love dinosaurs. And I've always loved dinosaurs since I was a kid. And this is a, uh, um, a painting done by a friend of mine, of course. Uh, uh, it'll show you what a uh, baby Sornitholestes probably looked like, or a baby Velociraptor as well. It's something that actually had feathers on its body. It's very closely related to birds um, and it's small. And I think it would have been a very cool pet to have too. But uh, for me, when I'm out looking in the Badlands for fossils, uh, I'm looking for evidence of what the biology of the dinosaurs were, uh, was and why they were so successful for so long. And we know that dinosaurs didn't die out. 75 million years ago or 65 million years ago. Dinosaurs, in fact, are the direct ancestors of birds. That's why many of these dinosaurs have been found now with feathers on their body, not just skin, but also feathers. And I think that's pretty cool that dinosaurs are still alive. Uh, we actually classify birds as one type of dinosaurs now. And modern biologists and modern paleontologists will classify birds as part of the dinosauria. So we still have 10,000 living species of dinosaurs, uh, which is pretty amazing. So they're still very, very successful animals. And I think that's pretty neat. So the next time you look at a bird, look at it a little bit differently because his ancestor was Tyrannosaurus rex. And I think that's really cool. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Wow. Thank